So today we sit down with James Smith talking about how he's gone from working in corporate to coming into the fitness industry as an in-person PT to today growing one of the most successful online fitness brands in the industry worldwide. He's an entrepreneur, best-selling author. So sit down, enjoy the show. James, how are you, mate? Very well, thank you for having me. Very nice production here at The Crown. You know what, like it just, it, honestly, it happened to kind of fit in with the flow. Like we were coming back from Queensland. We've had a lot of stuff going on, this acquisition and stuff like that. And um, we just had to kind of boot my wife and kids out, which I'll hear about later for this, mate. So it's obviously, um, yeah, we value you being here today. To break the ice, last time I was in here was about three years ago. And yeah. I was with two people that I can't mention and yeah. doing things we shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. About six in the morning, it was my latest night I've ever had in Sydney, but I, but I can't mention them. I'll tell you off air afterwards. Yeah. The one celebrity in my life I met on a night out and we just had a bender. Yeah. And this is the last, this is the next time I've been in a hotel room since. Oh, there you go. Half there haunted, go. but half inspired to be back. <laughs> Too easy, man. Well, look, obviously, look, for those of you guys that, I mean, live under rock, I'm pretty sure everyone in particular in fitness knows who you are. You're obviously a personal trainer, you're an online fitness coach. I was actually looking at your uh, Wikipedia today and they said you're the world's fastest growing online coach. There might be a techni technicality with that because there might have been people that have done it quicker, but then I'll be like, oh, he's, he's not. Yeah, yeah. He's not a coach. He's a, more and, of a chef. And you know what? Like, I kind of look at you. I remember, I remember eight years ago, and probably you don't know this, but eight years ago, nine years ago, when you were in Sydney working as a trainer, right? You were at Bondi, I think Bondi Fitness First? No, was no. It, I was at the clubs around I was there? at George Street just down George there. Street Fitness First. Yeah. yeah okay. And um, I remember hearing about you back when we had our city gym and like James, this, this trainer, he's growing this profile, he's going online. And I think it was like the early days of you really going on social media. And I think, you know, you've really been, from my opinion, like one of the poster people in the industry that's kind of taken social and really used it to leverage a brand, not just domestically, but internationally. Like, tell us like, how did you fall into it? Like, how did you go from kind of, I know you were in corporate, you went to working out of gyms, building a bit of a brand in fitness first to all of a sudden having this brand? So I was PTing in the UK, mm. very happy. I was in a budget gym, cost the equivalent about $700 a month in rent. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a step up when I came here and it was like 400 a week. Yeah, especially um, in the city. Yeah, and I was there for a few years, but there was only five other PTs in the gym. We had about two and a half thousand members. The gym was a $40 a month gym. Mm -hmm. It was in a technology park in kind of a weird place in Bracknell, but even just when I first got to the gym, I sat with the gym manager and I said, ah, oh, you're allowed to email the people in here as long as it's marketing. Mm -hmm. I said, can you do an email blast just introducing me and letting them know that I'm open to any questions and can you give them my email address? And he was like, okay, none of the other PTs before had done that. So I had my first 17 clients within my first week just from an email blast from oh, asking wow. the manager. So like straight away, you know, being that busy as a personal trainer that's never done PT before and just pretending yeah. that I've got experience, helped me in the onset but then that first year or two i experienced being busy burning out not charging enough doing mm. too many hours that one day that i did 14 one hour sessions and like the next day i remember just sitting in my car not wanting to get out i kind of i went through 50 shades of being a pt in my yeah, first couple yeah, of years yeah. and then i'll never forget kind of social media at the time was kind of emerging i was definitely fortunate in the sense mm. the video content in that 2016 2017 yeah. realm was you know i similar to you know how people at Microsoft and Apple got in there when computers mm. were just emerging. So I was very fortunate in that respect, but while all of my friends were saving money to get mortgages or to like get themselves on the property ladder, my interest savings account was building a following. Mm. And it never, I never meant for it to be massive, but I was like, if I can get 5,000 followers and then in four or five years time, I release a book or a program, I only intended to ever train 10 people face to face. So even yeah. when I had 15 clients, I, people are like, how are you going to build your business? I was like, well, actually I want 10. They mm. were like, what do you mean? I was like, I want 10 to see me three times a week. I only want to manage 10 people. Yeah, They're going to be, have to be wealthy. They're going to have to earn a lot. Mm. So like my whole approach to social media was if I can get 10 people to really like me, I'm done. Mm. If I can see them between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m., I can have a life that's congruent with the family where in the morning I've got to go, uh, you know, future wife, whatever. Can you look after the kids? I'll go pick mm. them up from school. You know, like I was always planning this from the early days. Then coming to Australia, I had, I had a psychedelic trip in uh, Croatia. It made me seem like I'm a druggie. I'm, yeah. I'm just honest, right? Yeah. Um, not anymore, I'm old now. Yeah. But 
And I remember having this really introspective conversation about going to Australia because even though I'd never been here, this was the epicenter of fitness. Mm. People yeah. take personal training more seriously. Your participation rate is higher. The quality of PTing and the quality of like, if you were to, I don't know, come into a bonus at work in Australia, someone like, you should get yourself some PT. Someone mm. goes, do you know exactly. what? I would. Yeah. In the UK, they go, don't waste your money on that. Yeah. So came here. Bio. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. Mm. It's, it's just very different. Yeah. So when I came here, um, interesting beginnings. I, uh, <laughs> I got invited by my mates to the beach. I had a couple of friends here from the UK. And one of them said, meet me on the beach, Bondi, 7 p.m. Uh, I'm not telling you what it is. We're not drinking. Just come here. So I was like, all right. I don't think it exists anymore. But we did something called No Lights, No Lycra. You ever heard of this? It rings a bell. I mean, I haven't participated myself, but... <laughs> Imagine. It was in Bondi Pavilion. It yeah. was a rave yeah. in the dark, completely sober, pitch black for an hour. Oh, wow. Okay. Sweaty, weird. It yeah. was like a bad thing. Then afterwards, everyone went to the sea and swam in the sea. Yeah. And a girl there was like, oh, what are you doing? I was like, I'm a PT. She was like, oh, my friend manages a franchise at Fitness First. Let me mm. connect you with him because you're okay. a PT wanting to get a job. Now, I was only on a tourist visa, so you can't get into fitness first as a pommy tourist. Yeah. If it wasn't for this random girl I met in the sea who connected me with someone that ran a franchise in one of the gyms, I would never have even got into fitness mm. first. So like this whole initial segment of where everything came from was built by chance. Yeah. And then uh, I joined- A bit, bit of serendipity. Yeah, like, um, so I started this franchise Terrible fucking decision. Never got the visa that I was promised. Yeah. It was an awful deal. I won't throw him under the bus, but it put me into George Street. I believe um, Adam Tracy was one of your clean yeah, health guys. He yeah, yep, yep. So uh, I remember as well. Was uh, Hattie there at the time still? No, no, no. They, this would have been after her time. Okay. But uh, I obviously held clean health in high regard because the trainers were just better. And this is the thing. I look at mm. someone like Adam Tracy. I look at some of the other guys from clean health. They were more organized. Yep. Their programming was better mm. because uh, I knew a lot of the kind of programming that everyone was kind of brainwashed to use the same person. Yeah. And like, I didn't know much about SNC compared to some of them, but I'd look around and see these like busy corporates doing like single arm cable rows. And I was like, this is really time inefficient. I get yeah. that you're looking to work on discrepancies. Balance them. Get them on a CRX row. Yeah. They don't want to be a, yeah. keep going. Exactly. How many, how many, is it, yeah, put your feet in a bit I easier. I think that's one thing like, and I've come full circle. I mean, I've been in fitness for 22 years. I did 15 years of PT and like 20,000 sessions as a coach, right? And back when I was a coach, I didn't like calibrate the type of clients that I was working with from the context. If I was working with a corporate guy who's like my age now, 40, got kids, got a business, stuff like that. I don't want to go in the gym and do one arm pullbacks. I just want to fucking lift. I want to, I want to sweat. I want to feel good. You know, I, I want to come out of that session feeling as though I accomplished something. So I think sometimes... PTs get in their own way. Exactly. And, and, and it hurts their business. And it's dull. And you can tell yeah. the PT's not enjoying it. They're not enjoying mm -hmm. it. And then, you know, I would always be off the cuff. And I used to get in trouble with this franchise I was with. They're like, that's not in the program. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be like, oh, do you want to try, try something different? I'm like, look, squat rack, there's two people waiting for it. I don't want to go over there. Let's yeah. go do something over here. And, you know, I'd go, I've only done this with a couple of clients. I'm not even sure if I'm teaching it right. You know, have some, <laughs> have some fun with it. You know, I'm learning, you're learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll never forget just before I started, uh, I was really skint and because I'd come over, I was on savings and fitness first were delayed with my paperwork and I had to start a month later. But to give people mm -hmm. an idea of how skint I was, I took a gig doing topless waitering for my friend who was a PT who was also a stripper. And I did it for $50. I went to Coogee from Manly where I was living mm -hmm. and I did topless waitering for $50. And I was like, <laughs> I, <love it. laughs> I was so, I couldn't wait to get into fitness first. Yeah, yeah. But I remember- um, A step up. Oh, one day I was getting the ferry and yeah. I remember like, I was reading a Tim Ferriss book, Tall of the Titans. Yeah. And there was one bit in it where it was like, if someone put a gun to your head, what would you do? Mm. And I was like, I would chase up all my old clients, everyone I'd ever done business with. Mm. I would get on the phone with everyone. I would try and resell them into what they were doing. I'd re-engage them, I'd ask them for referrals. I was like, why the fuck am I topless waitering when I've got prospects, leads, old contacts. I've even got an email list of 300 people. And what the, what yeah. the fuck am I playing at? Go in, it was a fun night, but what am I, what's wrong with you? So I went back home and I was like, mate, crack on, like get stuck into that. You should be making content, not pissing around. And 
the online coaching business started to bubble a bit, but when I went into fitness first, in my mind, the online coaching was just something to fill the gap before I could build my PT face-to-face -face mm -hmm. stuff. And there was another coach there called Darren Cartel, who now is one of my best mates. And we've worked together and done loads together. But he takes me aside one day and he was like, are you, you fucking dumb? He was like, these PTs that used to take the piss out of me because I used to go live in George Street. Uh, uh, every PT would finish about 8 a.m. and take breakfast. Mm. So you'd have like all of the, the clicky guys that have been there for a while. And I'd get my tripod out and I'd do a QA. and a And they used to giggle and like take the piss and be like, oh, you know, looking at that, whatever. But Duran came around one day and I had about 60 people on the live. And he was, he was like, oh, that's pretty smart. And he was like, you know, what do you do with it? I was like, oh, I get them to sign up to an email list, all of that. And he said, mate, are you an idiot? He goes, these guys taking the piss out of you would do anything to not have to come to work. And you're here making nearly a thousand dollars a week before you come to work. Mm. And it was kind of only when he said it that he was like, mate, all of us would kill to be able to work online. And yeah. you're thinking of packing it in for face to face. And then I was in a really tough time in Fitness First where one, there was 32 PTs in there. Mm. A lot of them were hyper vigilant, hyper competitive, but also very insecure. So me as a PT, I was like, I'm gonna to talk to everyone. And on yeah. my first day, one of the PTs in the PT room was like, if you talk to my client again, I'm gonna take your fucking head off. And the <laughs> PT manager comes out, was like, wow, wow, wow. She was like- Nice to meet you. She was like, you can't talk to him like that on his yeah. first day. She was like, James, I'm very sorry. I was like, I haven't even washed my fitness no, first you know what? what? I was at Bond Street Fitness first. Okay. Like so. about, uh, about five years before you, like in, in 2010, 2011. It was the same stuff, man. And I was like- You know, it was the sa that same kind of, um, insecure kind of scarcity mindset. And he, yeah. the thing is, if you're a good coach, like if someone was there chatting to my client, I wouldn't be like, oh, I need to go protect them. I'd be mm. like, if I'm delivering my service as well, yeah. book in a consult, take them yeah. for a consult. If you get my client, fair, fair game. And that's on me. Yeah, as a coach, similar to yeah. so many coaches uh, scared to pass their clients to someone else when they go on holiday. Yeah. And I would do it all the time. And I'd be like, look, you're gonna train with, you're gonna train with Dave next week. Mm. It's not gonna be pretty. It's not going to be pleasant. I will be coming back, you know, like yeah, have some fun yeah. with it. Um, so yeah, it was in there, but there was one day in Bond Street where for this franchise, they said, right, we're going to, uh, it's 2017, early on, get your clipboards out. Mm. We're going to stop people on their way in. We're going to get their email addresses. And I was like, hold on. Midday, corporates, mm. got an hour for work. They're coming into the gym to train. Mm you're trying to stop them from doing the one thing they've come in for, for yeah. their data. And I remember saying, you could just do a paid ad. You could just do a squeeze page. You could just mm. put something out there and return for their email. And it went completely over everyone's heads that were in the gym. And it was at that moment, I was like, okay, these other trainers are more experienced. They're more organized. They are objectively better trainers they are actually so well-rounded in so many places, but I was like, fuck, they don't know how to market themselves yeah. in any way apart from what they do. And some of the PTs in there had been there for 10 years with the same clients. They were actually living out the dream. They would they'd probably still be something there now. Yeah, exactly. And I went back in there uh, not yeah. too long ago. And I don't mean to say this in a disrespectful way, it was fucking haunting. There's now yeah. maybe six or seven full-time PTs in there. The pandemic wow. just ruined Decimated the place. It. People aren't back in the city, especially not to places like George Street. Competitions changed, better gyms have opened, the way that people train is yeah. uh, changing. So many things are different. And like, it's a constant evolving world, being able to market yourself and keep up and do all of these things. But I think it's the, like, and it's not, I don't think it's just trainers though. Like in particular in trainers though, you see it because we come in an industry where everyone's taught to learn right? You know, learn the evidence, learn the science, learn the principles, but they don't know how to translate that. So it's that concept of IQ versus EQ. I, I mean, for me, when I was a coach, there were a lot of coaches that were better than me, but they didn't have the type of stuff that you were talking about, that, that marketing eye, that way to provide extra value to their clients, that way to kind of give them that customer service and package it into a solution that the person feels like they're valued, they're having fun and getting results. You know, so it's not as monotonous. I mean, how did you find like from there, you know, starting to dabble in line, like how did you actually go from there to like founding your academy? Like what, what was that process like? So um, first of all, I remember uh, having a midlife crisis. It was like March 17th, 2017. I've had a few of those, they're great. 
Yeah, this one was good, right? And uh, I remember that was the time where I was like, I was in Australia Square. We got a little dining area. I was sat there. I've been prospecting all morning. I got no leads. And my two housemates at the time messaged me. They go, how's how's work? I went, not good. And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, I remember writing it on my laptop. What's up for desktop? I remember going, I'm hating this. And Mm. seeing myself write that, I was like, fuck, I've taken a risk. I've come to Australia. If I don't do something about this, I've got to move home to my parents yeah. in the UK. Okay. And I was like, I remember I went to office works on Pitt Street. How old were you then? Uh, 20, 28, 28. So- It'd be a, a hard thought process to swallow. Oh yeah. And I mean yeah. like, yeah. I loved Australia. I still love it. But like mm. March, still nice, sun's out, mm. beautiful coffee. You know, look at what's behind us. I was yeah. like, what? I'm going to have to turn my back on this mm. because I failed and I got- a board marker, a tripod um, from Office Works, And I went home with a ping pong table in our flat, which was for beer pong. Mm. And I set up the whiteboard and I was like, right, at 4 p.m., which is 6 a.m. in the UK, I'm going to go live. And I'm going to have to say something in a manner that's going to go some form of viral. Okay. And that became my thing. I went to work. I think the busiest week I ever had was like eight hours of PT. So I never established myself as a PT here. But then I'd go home and I would walk to Martin Place, get the train, get off at Bondi, walk back to my apartment, and I'd listen to an evidence-based podcast, um, whether it was like Eric Trexler, uh, you know, Brad Schoenfeld, Brett Contreras, you know, like the industry titans. But I remember like, I would get a buzz. I would listen to an evidence-based podcast that was so dry. It was so boring. I'd, oh, listen, yeah. I'd listen to like an hour of a, yeah. an hour podcast on caffeine, but I was like, no one else is gonna listen to this. Yeah. Then I'd go home and think of a funny angle for a video. So I started Mm. pumping it out, pumping it out, pumping it out. And then my business model was an editable PDF program, WhatsApp for desktop, Mm -hmm. a squeeze page and a landing page. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I took that to a thousand dollar a day business. And people were like, oh, so where's your app? I was like, no, no, it's one editable program. Yep. Uh, I was doing the lives at the end of the live. I'd say, please sign up to my email list. I would pin a link in the Facebook live video. Mm -hmm. Then as people would join the live later in the day, I would collect emails from that. I would then send out a daily email marketing campaign to a landing page, which um, I have like five principles, what it is, what they get, how much it costs, um, and why they should trust you. I think that was only four, but (laughs) I would just have a real simple landing page, no videos, whatever. So then it got to the point that I would do my video, write an email, wake up with clients. And the PayPal transaction would come through I would then have my little sign up process. And then in essence, I said to people, I'm here on WhatsApp, whatever you need me, voice note me, send me videos, send me your home gym, mm. send me what you're working with, show me the squat rack you're at the gym with. Yeah. And I will tell you how to use the pin loaded mm-hmm. parts that move. But a thousand dollars a day worth of co- coaching meant that I was actually then just sat on my sofa in Bondi all day, every day, just chatting yeah, to clients. You would have. I had a twitch in my eye. Yeah. And I remember the, I go into the opticians. I was like, can you fix this? They're like, you're having too much caffeine. You're stressed. I was like, I'm not stressed. <laughs> and then, um, I'll never forget. I there was, was going, no new tonic back then. Mate. No, no new tonic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, there was one guy leaving the gym. Yeah. It, the, the gym was full of PTs, but the guy leaving was also called James. And he was an English guy. Okay. I said to him, I go, why are you leaving? You know, when people are leaving a gym, you're like, why are you leaving? I'm suspicious. Yeah. Or like, I'm looking to buy a car at the moment. I'm like, why are you selling it? It's mm. a beautiful car. Why are you selling it? And he goes, yeah, I, I fucking hate people. He goes, I hate dealing with people, I hate being face-to-face people, complete opposite to me. And he goes, yeah, I just build websites. And I was like, who for? He was like, PTs. And I said to him, I've got an idea okay. where I want to create an educational platform, maybe charge people like $40 a month, mm. pre-record macros, calories, protein, how to squat, all of this. Mm. We're going to put it all in one place. And then that was how the academy was kind of formed okay. in was that 20, 2018, 2017. Okay. So uh, we kind of bootlegged it. He was a PT that taught himself to code. He mm. lived in Balmain. I was in Bondi. Um, I would pay him in the onset. Then we became business partners. And then when we opened it up to people, we had so many, we had a thousand people join within three weeks. Oh, wow. And our accountants were like, stop taking on clients. You haven't formed up your business yet. Neither of yeah. you are Australian residents. 
you're probably bastards without permanent visas. We've got yeah. the issue of setting up your business. We're going to need to find directors. Yeah. We need an Australian resident to like sponsor you, James. Like mm. all of these things. I had to get my ex-girlfriend to be like a, a, I can't remember what it's called, but to be on the account of the business for it to go head on them. Please, babe, yeah. <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we still, still yeah. running the business now. Mm -hmm. um, that's our B2C business. Um, and even to have a fitness business that's operated for, I think, six years now, six, seven years. Yeah, I mean, it's most fitness businesses don't last two or three years, mm -hmm. alone six years. So you kind of went from that. And, you know, one thing I remember probably, at least from afar, around 2018, 2019, starting to see you more at events. So like, how did you go from obviously, you know, you, you've, you've given it a crack at in-person coaching, you know, hit and miss. You've then gotten into online and then grown quite rapidly. How did you kind of make that jump? Because there's a lot of people that, you know, in our industry that get to that point of like, okay, I've got a six figure, a seven figure online coaching business, but then it stops. Like that's the ceiling. How did you go from that to now I'm presenting in front of a thousand people, I'm filling out tickets at the opera house, I'm, you know, coming to events like Clean Health Live as the keynote, you know, when there's some big fucking names there yeah. like Lane Norton and stuff like that. So like, how did that jump? I know it's probably not a short answer, but you know. Uh, so interesting. Talk I, us through that. I didn't really understand. I still don't know that mm. much about uh, business, business setup. So when we set up the business, they're like, yeah, your IP, you're gonna have a, a trust to here and don't, <laughs> I don't get any of it. I like, <laughs> yeah. I look at my business partner and I'm like, well, if I'm fucked, you're fucked. Like, is this all legit? Yeah. And even now still like, I, I got a tax bill the other day. I was like, I don't understand. Yeah. So I thought that if I did an event in the UK and I went back for it, that I could just expense everything, mm. which in some respects, now that I've kind of set up the business, I can. Yeah. But back then I was like, oh, I'll just pass it on to the accountant. So mm. I was like, I'm gonna do an event in the UK. I had 13,000 followers. And um, I was like, there's a hotel venue near where I live. I'll get like a little room there. And almost part of me was like, it'd be great if people come, but you know, if they do, great. And if they don't, uh, it'll be okay. And I sold 187 tickets for that event. By the time I flew home, I was at 30,000 followers. Wow. And I went there on my own, uh, made a little presentation. Uh, to have pictures of people was very strange because I was mm. 27 when I first ever had a picture with someone. Mm. I think the first one was on Manly Beach and someone was like, oh, what's your Facebook Live? It's legend. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like mm. 27, you, you're old enough to, I'm kind of glad it never happened when I was like 18, 19, or I would have probably ruined my life. But I did that event. And even though I'd look back now and think it was shit, mm. I was like, oh, that's quite cool. But then I was like, right, I'll do one in Sydney. My first one in Sydney, like, eight or nine people came to, it fucking bombed. And then I did one in Manchester as well. Another time I was back seeing my family and that got about a hundred people. Mm. Now, uh, net, I think it was profitable because the event here, um, you know, didn't perform too well. But I was kind of happy that I'd like, in my mind, even though only nine people came, I could tick off that I'd hosted an educational seminar on Australian yeah. soil. And, um, in 2017, maybe tw early 2018, I get an email from a, a guy called Luke. And he says, mm. hi mate, I wanna run your events for you. If I fly you to Dubai, will you meet me? And I was like, mm, can we just do a FaceTime? He was like, yeah, that's also fine. I think he was, I didn't realize that like, <laughs> when Ticketmaster and people want to book you, they wanna like wow you. I was like, yeah, yeah. It's like can we just FaceTime? So uh, I, I say, yeah, sure. And he says to me on the phone, he goes, uh, I've been watching your Facebook Lives. A lot of PTs there I don't resonate with. He goes, if you can hold 2000 people on a live for this is the Facebook good days, if mm. you can hold someone for 30 minutes on that, I think you'd be good in front of a crowd. So I'm back in the UK, I meet with him and he goes, how do you feel about doing a tour? He goes, 12 venues around the UK. I said, yeah, okay, I'm up for it. He goes, good, I've already booked it. So he'd already booked 12 venues. He comes from like a music background and he was mm -hmm. like, when you have an up and coming artist, you go out, and he goes, you actually go to places, you're not gonna make any money, probably mm. not gonna have enough there to cover your costs. But to him, he wasn't phased by it. So round one, we did like Leeds, Manchester, Maidstone, which is like a weird place in the UK. Some of them had 40, some of them had 90. And we would get like cool theaters and like cool places and we would mm. lose money and we were traveling around. I don't think anyone's insane enough to do those rounds where you don't have anyone there. Yeah. And he kept saying to me, next year, they'll bring a friend or two. And like, yeah. that was his main thing. So then 
the following year, uh, we did like a Christmas one. We we're like, I was back at Christmas, seeing my family. He goes, let's go to these places. Again, uh, we would bring like friends and other people. Uh, we would interact with the crowd. We'd, they'd be drinking, there'd be like inappropriateness. It was like, mm. it was an educational talk, but it was kind of a weird hybrid of like a mixture mm. of everything. Then when the first book deal came along, we were like, oh, how can we take the most poignant points of the book and bring them to life? Uh, as a live event. And then afterwards, you know, we'd sign books, we'd do selfies, we'd go out to a venue afterwards, we'd have an after party. Let me jump in there for a sec. Uh, the, the events, and I can, I can r relate to the, the part there about like doing events and kind of, it sounds like you guys really did it just to get the brand out and build that community. Yeah. And it, it, build that environment. So like so many people were like, okay, if I want to do an event, we want to do it to make money. And he goes, yeah. well, that's really short sighted. He goes, yeah, yeah. I agree. Because Luke as well came from a festival background where mm. he lost money year on year doing his festival. It was like the fifth year running the festival was profitable. Yeah. And no one's crazy enough to do things that way. Mm -hmm. I'm sure even like in the infancy of like the clean health events, like people are like, oh, if we're not going to make enough money, let's Look, not do the, it. Uh, this year, the first one, like we'd, we'd done workshops, but workshops and events are two different things. You know, an event is an experience. A workshop is, I'm going to learn. Um, and so we did our first event this year. It literally came from a discussion. And then I'm like, we're doing one in 12 weeks. And the team was like, um, what? And then 12 weeks later, we did our first one. We got to the event at a loss, but at the event, because we already had a product ecosystem behind us, that's where we made our revenue. Yeah, okay. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna try this. The worst thing that happens is we get a bunch of people together, we create all this content and we go away with a bunch of marketing footage. Um, and then I was like, oh, well, okay, well, we didn't make anything, but at the event we did, you know? So it was like, I was prepared to take that loss because again, I wasn't being short-sighted. I knew that, you know, the, the, the benefits that you get from creating a community like that, they, it's hard to put a dollar figure on them. It's also, um, it's interesting how poor a lot of fitness events are. So mm. there was one in the UK called Body Power, yeah. which I was invited to speak at. And although the event was great and it served a fantastic, uh, you know, fix for so many, there was loads of people in steroids walking around in stringy vests. And then there were some incredible evidence-based yeah. fitness speakers. And there wasn't even good audio in the room they were speaking. And I was like, we don't actually need the guys on steroids. We need these guys here. There's a guy who educated everyone that fasted cardio wasn't superior. This guy uh, broke down the insulin hypothesis, you know, mm. like, and I remember again, Luke has his events team and he said, let's do a fitness summit. So we had an IFS. Okay. So it's his events team kind of thing. Year one, Barcelona, 2019. Uh, first night, we got a guy called Charlie Sloth behind the decks. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that does the AU vodka. Okay. So he's like big character online. I went to Barcelona, stayed in the Fairmont. I think they lost like a hundred thousand pounds, like $200,000. Yep. One hell of a weekend party. Then we had yep. the pandemic, but we did an event in London. Um, then we did Lisbon, had the Artful Dodger as a DJ. Like mm. having an events a uh, minded event for fitness is better than having a fitness event trying yeah. to make it an event. Yeah, I, I agree. Look, to be honest with you, I've taken some inspiration from what you guys have done with the IFS because, you know, my observation, looking at it, you know, having been in the industry for 20 years, it's like a festival for fitness. Exactly. And that's, you know, such and a as beautiful... you can see the emotion, you know, the connection that you guys are having at these events. And it's great because at the, the, the integral center of it, is this business to business aspect where coaches don't just get to pay for their weekend, they get to learn things from it. And I, mm. I've said this before. So in the year before I came to Australia, I was at business talks, I was at business events. I mm. was on a Saturday morning getting up at 6 a.m. to go stand on a cold train platform to go into London, to sit in a room full of PTs, of which I knew none, of which I was very intimidated mm. to be in front of a speaker that scared the shit out of me to get a picture with him at the end with a sweat patch the size of my fucking hand to then go home inspired. So like- Who were some of the speakers back then? So uh, you would have had, there's a guy called Phil Lerny in the UK. I know Phil. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I had Phil, he, um, he did some workshops at the Old Clean Health. So he, uh, in the very, very early days, probably what, 2015? Yeah, yeah. Went yeah. to one of Phil's talks. And when he said what he said, it made it feel so much more accomplishable. Mm. But I'll never forget, fast forward three, four years, I was like, there was 200 people in that room. I only remember one of them. Yeah. Jamie Alderton was the only person in the room that I ever saw again online. And I was like, where did you guys go? Mm. And I realized- Where are they now? <laughs> and I was like, it wasn't so much about what we learned. It was yeah. about what they did with what they learned. 
And mm. that's why now when I do the business events, I don't just want to educate, I want to inspire people to take action. Mm. And like, even I did an event in Melbourne the other day and this girl's working for a health club and she's complaining about wages, but the health club determined how much she earns. I was like, how much you get an hour? She goes, oh, about $80. And I was like, oh, it sounds to me like you should leave. And she was telling me all the benefits mm. of this health club. And I go, how much would you like to earn? She goes, oh, about 120. And I was like, then why the fuck are you working for that health club? Mm. And she was like, oh. And then I, her friends next to her, I go, is she worth more than $80? She's like, yeah. I was like, well, fucking quit. And then everyone in the room, I was like, do you know what? Make a bit of noise if you think she should quit. And I was like, fucking quit, go on, go. Like, and I was like, I was like, sweet, she's either homeless or we changed her life. But you mm. know, like you, it's not enough to just give them the information. But then I'll never forget how scared I was to go to these events on my own as a coach. Like yeah, yeah. the majority of people that go are solo. Yeah. They need to go to their first event to realize they make friends because not all the other coaches at the gym, one, want to do that well themselves because mm -hmm. they're also petrified. Two, they don't want to see you do well. Mm -hmm. We all saw like tall poppy syndrome. Like when I started putting stuff out online, it really rubbed coaches the wrong way. Yeah, Like yeah. it made me incredibly unpopular. And the only yeah. person that kind of supported my success was Dieran who I worked with. And that was because he, everyone saw it, what I was doing and they found a, a narrative to hate me for it, yeah. where he was the only one that could be inspired by it and go, mm. if he can do it, I can do it too. Which so many fitness coaches lack. Mm. If they could only have that same uh, viewpoint of success. Success is to be celebrated. I mean, if I see someone doing it well, I'm like, fuck, good on you, man. Like go and, go and smash it. I think, you know, that, that mindset shift, but coming back to the event. So like you, you use those in essence to kind of build that trust, that engagement with the community. And then obviously you mentioned before that your first book was the not a diet book. And I think you released that in 2020 or 2019. Really early 2020. Yeah. And pre COVID. Yeah. Then I remember, um, so, uh, sign with the publisher. If you self publish, you're going to make more money. But mm. I remember our publishers being like, I was actually on a book signing tour in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And all my best mates came and surprised me at the book sign. And they're like, we're going out in Dublin. I was like, fuck it, I love a night out yeah. in Dublin. Just some sign in the last three books. My mate comes over and goes, you're getting on a plane tonight. You're doing Piers Morgan tomorrow? Oh, and wow. then I was excited. But then my manager was like, there's a chance you might not be. They're getting you on standby. I said to him, what do I do? He's like, you're fucking going to London. He's like, I don't mm. give a shit. He's like, if we went out and party tonight and they wanted you. Mm. So I was like, cool. So three or four of my best friends went out in Dublin, had a great night and I'm on a plane, but he came with me. He was like, I'll come with you to London. Mm. We stayed in the shitty place, Shepherd's Bush. And the whole idea he said to me, this is Luke as well. He goes, this is the angle they're going to try and fuck you over on. It was a body positivity and fat shaming thing. Yeah. And the TV company were like, uh, we want you to fat shame peers on TV. So I agreed to it, but I was like, I'm not fat shaming peers on TV. Mm. So on the plane on the way back, I just thought through every single scenario, everything would come back, everything I could do. Even at breakfast, Luke was saying to me, he was making up scenarios where they were going to blindside me. Mm. And we did the interview and like, there was so much adrenaline. I look back at it now, I look quite relaxed. I almost didn't remember the interview. I was so fucking mm. nervous doing it. And I get off and he gives me this massive hug and he was like, you fucking nailed it. Uh, and we sat in the green room and he was like, I would have written the book for free for that interview. So the bonus mm. you got, the signing fee, everything, fuck it all. You just had uh, nine minutes going head to head with Piers Morgan on TV. We sold 12,000 mm. hardbacks just from that interview, wow. which secured us the number one bestseller slot, mm -hmm. um, which we weren't sure we were going to get. So then like you have this, this crazy world where you're like, okay, we, we chose financial shortcomings with the events to build mm, the community. Yeah, we chose financial yeah. shortcomings with the publisher to yeah. get the exposure. Like there are all these little chess plays that, that had to go on. Well, it's a mindset side of things. I think, you know, whether it's entrepreneurs or PTs, sometimes they become short-sighted. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm losing here. I shouldn't do that. And it's like, well, sometimes it's like polarity. Sometimes you've got to take some losses to take some fucking big wins. You know, I even look at it in the context, as I mentioned with the Clean Off Live thing, like we'll front up a, a crap ton of cash to get this event up and running. You know, it's 10x bigger than what we did this year, but I just have faith that it'll come through, right? And so you just kind of let it, I think, you know, you, you gotta be able to risk things or, or at least feel as though you can. And like the, you can create that element of FOMO for people as well, which mm. we certainly did with the events. And like uh, when we did book two, so I got to write that during the pandemic mm -hmm. and then, um, 
when we did the tour for that, because they reduced like GST, VAT, uh, interest rates were at an all time low. Yep. Like looking back, I didn't realize how good the times were. We got to a point in the tour where Luke looks at me and he's like, we've done more money from the tour than the book. <laughs> and that clicked for us. We were like, I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, well, the tickets, we got this. The venues were fucking yep. not booked. So you got great deals on the venues. You got um, reductions in like VAT, corp tax, all of these things. And we're like, fuck. So we did our second book tour. And he was like, mate, the tours can make more money than the book. Mm. And I was like, fuck. So we're, we're writing a book for a year to make a talk the last two hours. I was like, mate, this is brilliant. Because then the events promote the book. The book promotes the events. You've got this great synergistic twist between the two. Mm. Then for How To Be Confident, which was um, a very fun one to write, the live show came together because now I'd, I was on my fifth tour. Mm -hmm. So I did the first one where we just got pissed with everyone. The second one, the Christmas one, got pissed with everyone. Then we did book one, book two, then book three tour. Like I never realized how much we'd improved our like stage present presentation, mm. like just everything from it. And then we did uh, Hammersmith Apollo, which was three and a half thousand people. Wow. And that was fucking crazy. But the wildest thing was, so like it was, it was a big event. I was looking forward to it. Uh, actually one thing to do with this drink, like we were saying before, I hid a can of actually, ghost. Yeah, I, I might have a bit now. Yeah, I, I, I'm- My one thing for events is that I'm well primed to talk. Yep. So, new tonic coming out. <laughs> and um, I hid this can of ghost in the fridge and it had like alpha GPC and these other nootropics in it. And I thought someone had drunk it before the event. And I was like, oh, you've just ruined the whole night. Just ruined yeah. the night for me. And then I found it and I was drinking it. But then Luke walks in, my mum and dad, never been to an event. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Well, they actually came to that first one with 180 people. Yeah. And I went home after. I was quite proud of myself. And my dad mm. goes, well done, son. Proud of you. Me and your mum left at halftime. It's not really our thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, so then uh, it's their first ever event. Yeah. And in this talk, like... It's, it's not just aspects from the book. I'll go from like, it's like a TED talk with fingering jokes. Mm. So there's one part where I talk about how giving up wanking could have helped me when I was dating when I was younger. And he says to me, he looks at me, he goes, your parents are in the crowd, but you got to keep in that segment yeah. about Becky and about wanking. Mm. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, it's going to be embarrassing. Mm. Um, but then you get people that, you know, people in TV, people, music artists, whatever, comedians that are mm. like, how the fuck did you sell out the Hammersmith Apollo? They're like, yeah. and I had a comedian come to the show and he goes, he looks at me and he goes, Kay Curd, his name is, he goes, mm. do you know what? He goes, do you know why you're lucky? I go, what? He goes, they don't expect you to be funny. And he goes, yeah. me as a comedian, I have to be funny. He goes, yeah. you as a PT, no they don't expectation. expect you. Yeah. So like, and the it's same goes point. for people like, you know, like Lane, like mm. Sebastian Oreb. Sometimes they crack a joke and you're like, oh, what a bonus, what a bonus bit of content to have. Over delivering. Yeah. So like mm. Seb being inappropriate or whatever it is. Yep. Like, yep. Um, so trying to find that mix is is definitely like a an art form, but it also, it you know, you forget as a PT, you're a professional speaker in our intervals throughout the day. Mm. Like you're, having to take on, you're having to be reactive, you're having to deal with people's emotions, you have to prod them, you're having to challenge them. Like even the amount of times that your clients, they say something and you're like, I know what you're doing, you're saying this because you want a reaction. Similar mm. to how we very frequently will say something to someone because we want to get talked out of it. You know me, yeah. I'll be like, oh, want to buy an Audi RS6. And then they tell you to buy it. You're like, mate, you're supposed to tell me not to buy it. You're supposed to tell me it's a waste of money. You're supposed yeah. to, but your clients do it to you too. Mm. So we've got so many coaches, trainers, where they're, you know, vocal, personal, all of these skills they've been developing for mm. years on the floor. But then you give them this kind of weird separation between the crowd and the stage and it mm. cripples them. So do you think that, and I mean, it probably, uh, I know you expand on this in your book, you know, what is confidence, right? So like, in your words, like, what is it? You know, because I think for, from, again, from someone who's observed you, I feel like, you know, to make that, to cross that bridge from PT to filling out the Apollo and stuff like that, there's a massive amount of confidence that comes into play there. And I feel like that's a missing element, not just for PTs, but for men or people in general. Like, you know, what is it to you and how have you built it? I have a three prong answer to this, which mm -hmm. will save anyone having to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> the first is we could call bullshit on confidence and say, you either did the thing or you didn't. 
Mm. Now, if you go through life not doing the thing, mm. you need a narrative and a lie to tell yourself so you don't feel like shit. Mm. And a good narrative is, I'm not a confident person. Yeah. The girl you saw on the train that you didn't talk to, the job interview that you never went to, the pay rise you never asked for, the, you know, fucking mistake they made at the restaurant that you were too much of a pussy to correct the waiter for. Mm. All of these things, if you suffocate underneath this life of constant inactions, you can paint a narrative you're not confident. Mm. And that excuses people from having to face uncomfortable situations. So I say to people, when the opportunity presents itself, you need to take action. So let's say that you are a single man, and there's a woman on the train, Martin Place, and you think she's really hot and she hasn't got headphones in and you want the, the hey, never usually do this. I think you're beautiful. I would love the opportunity to take for a drink. Before you tell me you've got a boyfriend or not, feel free to lie to me. I won't yeah. take it personally, whatever. Now, if she goes, I'm really sorry, I'm married. You can have a giggle and you go, well, I hope you have a great day. Yeah. And she's probably smiling, feeling good about it. You're probably smiling. You leave the train. And even though you got rejected, you feel amazing because you did it. Mm. Whereas if she gets off and you go, fuck, I never have the confidence to talk to someone. It's not about confidence. It's about you either did it or you didn't. And it really is taking action, isn't it? It is. It's, what, what, it's what separates people. It's and action. So, so then you have that. Mm. So then the second prong thing is there's a theory called the Zyganic effect where uh, a Soviet psychiatrist, no, he would have been a psychologist. Uh, yeah, psychologist. He wasn't dishing out meds. Observed mm. that waiters and waitresses remember what people have ordered up until the point they paid the bill. So mm. if that's the case, it means that when they pay the bill, they no longer have to remember. So they forget. Open tasks keep up to cognition in our minds so that even when students are studying, they will stop halfway through study and go do something else and come back and help with their memory. TV shows will tell you what's coming next to open a loop so that you have to close it. Cliffhangers at the end of a series are opening a loop so you have to close it. When you leave a loop open, it creates mental cognition to close it. You know, mm. did I fucking lock the door? Yeah. There's a loop that you've created mm. in your mind, you need to close it. So now I say to people, the action in action thing, you now need to see everything you present yourself with as loops. You have the opportunity to close them, so close them. It might mm. end up with rejection. It might end up with things going wrong. It might end up with humiliation, but at least you've closed it. So next time you think you need to find confidence, you don't. You need to find the ability to close the loop. Mm. And if you can go through life closing loops, they only become easier to close. Yeah. Then the third thing, the third part of that is about people that are confident are okay with failure. And yeah. failing is a really hard thing for people to have a relationship with. Hicks and Gracie, one of the most decorated martial artists of all time, I had him on a podcast and he goes, losing is not the same as being defeated. He goes, if you lose a fight, you've lost. But if you never fight again, you're defeated. 100%. And he goes, if you step on the mat, you can't be in control all the time if you win or not. But mm -hmm. if you never step on the mat again, you've been defeated. And there are so many coaches who tried an email marketing thing, tried putting out content, tried doing this. And they think that they, they had lost, but they're not. They're defeated. They completely stopped. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone's not afraid, you know, things might go wrong. Things might not work out. But if you can change your mindset to deal with losses as being fine, mm. you need to lose for a very long time before you win. Some of the, one of the best wrestlers ever in America, he's like, I'll shoot your sprawl, which is a defense. And he goes, mm. but one point, you're not going to be able to sprawl anymore and I'm going to still be shooting. He goes, then I'll mm. take you down. And I was like, that should be everyone's fucking offense, boxing. You just got to keep jabbing, keep jabbing, keep jabbing. No one can defend forever. And I'm not saying that you're attacking your climate, your, your prospects or your clients, yeah, but yeah. you need to be tenacious. You need to be wholly. Have you always had that mindset? No, it takes, it takes training, mm. but you know, you, you build up, you build up some tolerance there. And also then the more successful you are, the more hate you get, the more criticism you get, you know. You that's, I think that's a big one that, that stops a lot of people. It's the, the tall poppy. So it's like mm. the more speed you generate, the more dangerous it is mm. as well. So you, there are so many like caveats to this and so many different ways you're going to get hit from different angles, but you need to kind of like, you need to stay on course and you need to keep being tenacious with it, which is why like, um, another reason why I love training jujitsu, which I mm. speak about a lot, but like, it's the same in that realm where if you don't keep getting better, someone else will. Yep. And they'll progress and you'll watch them overtake you and you won't be able to beat them. You need to stay in your own lane. You need to keep developing your own things. And you need to have this kind of mentality. And like, you'll, you'll be aware of this more than me, but a lot of business owners, solopreneurs or whatever, 
so many of them have an opportunity, not just for themselves, but for their families, yeah. for their partners, for their kids. And like, if you look at the world now, this is a really savage thing to say. The separation of wealth is only becoming bigger. You need to pick right. which side you want to be on. 100%. And like, I'm not on that wealthy side mm. yet, but I want to be. Because mm. I want options. I want accessibility. I want people in my life to not have to worry or to have these issues. And like... I say when it comes to that, it's like, whatever you're doing, you want to have massive passion for it. So you're obviously massive, you know, massively passionate about what you do. But I find, you know, I find for me having that plus my why, for me, my why is, yeah, sure, I want to create change in the world, but I want to create a, a safety net around my family for generations to come. So that with everything that's coming into the world, whether it's AI, whether it's this, whether it's that, blah, 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 they've at least got some level of security around them. You know, that's a big why for me. But I think a lot of, you know, whether it's a trainer, entrepreneur, whatnot, they just, coming back to your point, it's the inaction. You know, they're not willing to put it all on the line to do that. And everyone has, a th I think, a different pendulum for risk, you know? A hundred percent. And even another analogy here is, I never even really understood jujitsu till I was 28. Mm -hmm. Now there are black belts who are 18. Then at 28, the first year or so was very difficult, but then I was like, I'm going to become a black belt. Mm. Mm. 10 year journey minimum. Yep. And then as you progress and you, you get better, I realized the more you work at it, the more you study, the quicker you can become better. And then I was like, oh, I can take that same mentality into everything. Yep. Before we started recording, I was like, oh, ND filter, oh, roadcaster, oh, cameras, A7S, whatever. I actually now want to become a black belt in every endeavor in my life. Yeah, so it. whether it's copywriting, landing pages, mm. focal lengths on the camera, different brands, like, because I've proved to myself in one area of my life that I can work to, and I might never get my black belt, mm. but the process of working towards it, you know. It was a mentality, it's an attitude. Yeah. It's an attitude, I and, think. And people, when you're in the gym and you're lifting weights, mm. you kind of don't really feel like you're making progress. You might get stronger here and there, but there's so much noise and bullshit and steroids and fakeness and all of this and the fitness mm. industry succumb to it. To remove myself from that and go into martial arts, and to be a purple belt and be six years in and to be making true progress. And then the best thing is, so many people that get their black belt go, this is where it begins. You've just yeah. got past the first part of noise. Now this is the rest of your journey. So even the amount of people that get to the point where they're like, I just want to be able to afford a nice house, nice car. Then they get that and you know, this is where it begins, mate. You now got to pay off the mortgage and then- I honestly, like after you know the acquisition yesterday, I feel like 22 years in, it now begins. Mm. Exactly. 22 years into fitness, 16 years into clean health, I feel like it actually begins now, you know, which is a, I, I told someone that yesterday and they're like, huh? But I'm like, it's because I don't place limits on what is possible. And, you know, for me, it's like, I like putting myself in, in situations where I'm uncomfortable because you either, it forces you to grow or not. And I find that, you know, when you put yourself in those situations where you feel a bit nervous, you feel a bit anxious, I'd rather lean into it than away from it. And I think um, you know, that's a, a mindset limitation as you spoke about before that just a lot of people aren't at yet, you know, and obviously- um, I still yeah. shit my pants all the time, right? Any account yeah. with blue tick messages me, I get nervous. You know, like even, even like, it, it's so crazy. A lot, it's not a facade, but mm. it's a lot of reprogramming. I always, the, the emotions I face are the same as everyone else's. It's just how I deal with them. Mm. You know, I'm uncomfortable at times. Yeah. I don't want to work at times. I don't want to wake up sometimes. You know, well, I don't want to wake up, that's a bit much. Don't want to get out of bed, that's what I yeah. mean. You know, there are days, but then it's how you deal with those emotions. 100%. So many people feel these emotions of fear, insecurity, or, you know, looking at a camera and saying something. I'm like, okay, cool, that is normal. Now let's get to the next point. Similar mm. to when people first start training, you know, you get, well, I can't lift anymore, but you, you probably can. Oh, there's two more reps. Yeah, fucking pussy, I told you. You mm. know, like mm. you had that in you, you just didn't do it. Mm. And I think people need to summon that upon themselves. And another thing that's crazy is how competitive some people can be in one domain of their life, but they can't bring it across. Yep. So you see guys who will starve themselves for 20 weeks to look better than someone else, mm. but they won't put the work into their business mm. or sit in front of a camera. Mm. Same way in jujitsu, you've got guys who are world champions, but they haven't even got a fucking sales funnel. You yeah. know, like people are masters in their areas of their lives. They just need to take that. And some physique competitors, if they just put half the effort they did into one I thing, know, into right. their business, mm. they'd be here doing this podcast, not me. <laughs> exactly. Talk, talk to that actually about the, I guess the, 
I mean, I, I prefer to use the term mental fitness than mental health, you know, because yeah. it's to me, the concept of mental fitness is I can train myself up to kind of react to certain events or experience in my life a different way, right? So take a an anxious situation into something that might be more positive. Like, have you, do you do anything on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of, or have you to kind of adjust your mindset? Or has it just been something where you kind of watch your thoughts, you observe them and... Do you know what? I did therapy a bit earlier this yep. year. Okay. I, I fucking hated it. I really hated it. <laughs> I was really done excited. A bit that too. <laughs> so well recommended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, I had, uh, uh, I actually got recommended by my publisher to go get an ADHD test. Okay. Yep. And uh, that was very eye opening. Mm -hmm. And it was, it cost about three grand. And yep. like, it's annoying because people think it's trendy at the moment. Yeah. But so when I did the assessment, she was like, two things. She's like, one, uh, you have ADHD, but she was like, your hyperactivity is mental not physical. So they did, mm. they put these like a uh, little electric nodes on your head. Shock uh, therapy. Uh, yeah. Something like that. But like <laughs> yeah. my brain is more active with my eyes closed and more active looking at a painting than it is doing maths. So they got okay. me to do an exam and she was like, so she asked me a questionnaire afterwards, but then when they got the scan she was like, this is a regular. Mm. Usually when people close their eyes and then I was like, oh, I listen to podcasts when I fall asleep. And she mm. goes, but that's probably indicative. She goes, your brain switches yeah, on when you close your eyes. It. So like, I have all these weird things. Yeah, yeah, and then I had this mm. massive conversation with her, but she was like, second thing, she was like, you have anxiety. And I was like, well, that's not cool. Yeah. And I didn't think- No, I don't. Yeah, I was like, no. <laughs> no, I don't. She was like, um, <laughs> we were talking it through and she was like, oh, actually what you do is you create anxiety in your mind to attach importance to things so they get done. Mm. And I was like, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I've actually found that I catastrophize the outcome of things not going right. So mm. I fabricate this real falling off, losing, uh, you know, any relevance, people not wanting to engage, come to your talks, all these things. I create this fear in my mm. mind to keep me motivated, which isn't the healthiest tactic. Mm. You know, like I wake up some days and think about everything crashing down as a reason to get up and get on with stuff. I'm like, if I don't keep trying to, um, you know, keep evolving myself, I'm mm. going to lose everything, mm. which there's not really any evidence to support that. No. So I wouldn't say I struggle, but I'm very, there's a lot of things going on in my mind that I create mm. to induce stress, induce anxiety, but therefore to get uh, an emotive response from it. I do struggle very much with appreciating where I'm at or what I've accomplished. Like, that's, a, that's a big one. I, I mean, look, you're a high performer, successful person. Like it's, uh, you know, it's very hard to, you know what, what obviously helped me to be honest was having kids. And then a few years ago, I went through a massive nervous breakdown myself where I was like suicidal. I was uh, having to take antipsychotics, antidepressants, stuff like that. I'd had a massive nervous breakdown over like after 15 years of just like this. And I'd never taken the time to stop and actually feel into how I was feeling. I was had this kind of, you know, trying to create drama, trying to create stress, trying to create some sort of thing to achieve some sort of goal. And it wasn't until I went through that process and actually learned how to, oh, okay, actually I'm feeling that way and sit in it and not, not label it, you know, and just, I am anxious right now. In you know, the last week, fuck, I've been anxious at 10 o'clock at night, ain't like anxious as fuck, but I've learned to embrace it for what it is. And it's like, Eckhart Toll talks about it. It's like, this too shall pass. Yes. You know? <laughs> I, this I, too shall pass you know if there's like, too much noise in my mind yeah. i didn't ever want to take the medication like yeah. i'm worried i'll like it too much yeah. um and i'll just take the dog out i'll just go for a walk put my phone in my pocket and similar to what you said i'm like okay i'm anxious about this mm. normal response yeah i'm anxious about this probably overreacting a bit yeah and then you kind of just take stock of these different things okay what what is really important today is that really important or are you just making it seem important so you yeah. can get it done um so there's always continual work but the work being done versus the problem is like a net positive. Whereas some people don't do enough work mm. and that's where things can become an issue where yeah. you're not, you know, you're, you're trying to rev the engine too much for the amount that you're looking after it. And mm. there, there always has to be balance. But I think the, my life's very chaotic in that sense that, yeah. uh, or my mind's very chaotic. I'm very disorganized. Right. Mm. So to anyone listening to this and you think you yeah, haven't got your life together, you're very disorganized. I'm more disorganized than you, but <laughs> After a while, you can make it work. Yeah. I'm very lucky to have dependents in the same that my manager will, you know, he'll message me at 7 a.m. You have a podcast, 8 a.m. He knows I've forgotten. Yeah. He knows I've completely forgotten. Yeah. 
my missus, I'd be like, I have the dentist on Tuesday at three. You know, I've got these people around me that now they know when I tell them, I'm not telling them, I'm asking them to please remind yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, oh no, it's Thursday. They're like, it's Friday. I'm like, fuck. So yeah, yeah. It, you don't, I think like the craziest thing is to all of this, you don't have to be organized. You don't have to be particularly well skilled. You don't have to be like, you know, all you really want, all you really need is to want it. Mm. Like I can't express that enough. I didn't do well at school. Um, the only reason I would, handle myself well on a camera is through doing th thousands of hours even the yeah. same as like doing a podcast i've done mm. hundreds of episodes like people were always i know you you were telling our um videographer here you know every bitch way of uh, technology up here <laughs> there you go just like uh <laughs> but i think if you can be interested in it yeah and like everyone everyone's always wanting to progressively overload their knowledge in the gym mm. just take that and put it into other areas of your life and everything just becomes so much easier agree like an interesting tangent I never uh, really realized. I said this just before, it was about YouTube was always like my lagging platform. Mm. And I always thought like, oh, you know, just don't know the platform that well. I had done in Kruger effect on it. I had a million followers on Instagram, but no one's watching my YouTube content. I thought it was just my audience. It wasn't. I was just putting out completely the wrong content. It was shit. It was shit. I wasn't man enough. I wasn't educated enough. Mm. I wasn't, I wasn't the man I needed to be for that platform. So to be in a place where you've got a nice house, you've got a lot of followers, your business is doing well, and then to join a course and actually start studying again. I didn't, I posted maybe like once every two weeks on Instagram for like two, three months. My manager's like, I get that you're working on YouTube, but yeah. you still need to post on these platforms that you have yeah. millions of followers. He's like, we need to keep the lights on, you know? Yeah. But doing it, I got to learn about just, we so much say to people, pay for our services, yeah, let yeah. us upskill you, learn the trade. You got to do it yourself, it. practice what you preach. And then, yeah, I did it. And it was the fucking best decision ever. Yeah. Like, and even 10 years into making content, I'm watching videos going, I can't believe I didn't know that. Mm. Can't believe I didn't realize that. So what would you say actually on that, on that tangent? Like, obviously you've built up this massive community and following online on Instagram and your YouTube's grown a lot too. What are some key difference between creating content on Instagram compared to YouTube that you've found? The best for rule, them to land. Best rule for both. It's not mm. about you. Yeah. It's never about you. Fitness people do a vlog. No one fucking cares. Yeah. They don't care. And for me, I've accepted that now. I'm a vessel of information. It's always mm. about them. Mm. Everything is about them. Yeah. So stop posting your fucking lunch. Stop posting mm. your fucking workout. Start thinking about their problems and help them. Because if you are subservient to their needs, they will love you for it. Mm. The minute you make it about yourself, which can happen when people get a big following, they start thinking, I have a big following because I'm great. When the truth is you have a big following because you helped a lot of people. Yeah. Even little things, right? My thumbnails, I was putting myself in it when the video wasn't about me. Mm. I was like, why the fuck have I just put my fate? Like if, if you're talking about the iPhone and you've got a big iPhone channel, you can believe it's the iPhone that's in the picture. Yep. Where some people are like, and you're like, get your fucking face out of it. They don't care about yep. you, you know? And like, it was really difficult for me to come to the fact, that, but then I found peace with it. Mm. It's not fucking about me, it's about them. And then the more you can remove yourself from it and just realize that you are subservient to those people, the better. And then again, um, about so many people that come across your, uh, con you always got to watch your content back as if someone's never seen you before. Mm. So I was wearing a pair of short shorts the other day in an edit and I said, get that out. Yeah. He goes, oh, but you always wear short shorts. I was like, mate, if someone's coming to this video the first time, they're going to think I'm a fucking prick. <laughs> like, you know, I, I was like, there's way too much dick in this shot. And yeah, I was like, yeah, to people yeah. that watch my videos for a while, yeah. they go, oh, short shorts. To other people, they yeah. go, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. So like looking at rewatching your content and thinking, if you saw this for the first time, would you really like this person? Because mm, mm. even when you like start being funny or whatever, uh, that can be really difficult. Um, how, how would you say your approach differs for Instagram compared to YouTube? Uh, so like obviously those core principles you keep, the, but is there a different kind of delivery mechanism? You, the, there was a point on Instagram where videos had to be 59 seconds mm. and I never to be, I had to become a real prick in the videos because how else would I keep growing my brand? So instead of being like introduction, nuance, topics, takeaways, mm. principles, whatever, I had to just go guns blazing for 60 seconds. He's a cunt, he's a cunt, he's a cunt, yeah. what this? And then I look back now at those content and I hate who I was for it. Okay. So then, but there has to be an alien, an element of that in short form. Otherwise mm. you just won't capture other. Because the thing is, and this was a hard pill for me to swallow. 
People are just doing this. And you have only a few seconds to capture them. And they are savage and they don't give a shit. But this yeah. was the hard thing for me, right? was a million followers on Instagram, put a video on YouTube, got 4,000 views. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I follow maybe 2,000 people on Instagram. Yeah. But how many of them do I watch their YouTube videos? Yeah. Maybe four. Mm. So I was like, oh, people have served your content based on the algorithm. They're not going to look for it. I was like, if you can make a piece of content that people there'll be eight videos in front of them. They pick yours. That's the real flex. Mm. And also I came to realize that when a subject is really important to me, I will find a YouTube video and I'll actually put the phone down as I'm listening. Mm. So trying to distinguish between getting the Audi RS4 or the Audi RS6, it's an 18 minute video. After the first minute, my shoulders relax. I put it on the side. I start emptying the dishwasher and I listen. Mm. That way of communicating with people, I think is so elite and almost a thousand views in that way is more valuable than 50,000 views on a short okay. or a reel. And for me, I was like, I want to have an emotional connection with someone that goes beyond just the funny reel or 60 mm. seconds, but I still need to keep catering to the people that don't fucking want to listen for 10 minutes. Yeah. They just want 45 seconds. Like, oh, that's interesting. Mm. So now I'm finding that I have to create content for both people. Similarly to um, say there's a, a subject, say Lane Norton talking about uh, sweeteners in a beverage. Mm. Some people want the eight minute breakdown. Some people want the 90 second version. Yep, yep, okay. And depending where they're having that argument, they might be having it at the kitchen table. So there they need the short. But mm. then if they're gonna do a video on it themselves to present to their university class, they're gonna want the long one. Mm. So, so, many, and so many different people are in so many different uh, behavioral habits that you don't wanna change the habits, you wanna to cater to them instead. Mm. Same way that I'll never post a link to YouTube on my Instagram because okay. if I've made a video that's 12 minutes long and you're out for dinner with your wife and she takes the kids to the toilet and you're sitting there and you're having a bit of garlic bread and you see my story and I go, go watch this video. It's fucking amazing. You yeah. know, oh, James posted a video, click on it. One minute in, oh yeah. Then your wife comes back, you switch off. YouTube goes, this video is shit because people are leaving at one minute. But the issue mm. is I tried to change their behaviors. So someone's on a Tinder date or they're walking to the train station or they're about to get in their car. I've told them to go watch a long video through a short video format content platform. They're not in the right behavioral mode to do it. So instead, you are better off people that are on YouTube that are ready to let their shoulders drop and to sit down and to listen to you that are emptying the dishwasher than you are forcing someone that's on a short form content to go across to, to mm. watch it. All of these things I never even thought of before. Here's a question on it. If you had the knowledge back in 27 or 2017 that you do now about social, right? And these platforms were in 2017 and you had zero followers, which path would you go now? Insta, TikTok or YouTube and YouTube or why? Probably YouTube. Okay. And um, there's part of me that beats myself up for it. Mm. And I said this once and Luke, my manager again, he goes, yeah, well, Insta and TikTok, they bought your fucking house, you little cunt. You know, like, <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so like, um, he was like, yeah, don't hate it too much. But like, I kind of, there's, there's part of me that I was like, oh, I've, I've kind of missed that deeper connection. And maybe uh, I would have been able to keep more people along the way. Because so you feel you, you, YouTube, obviously, you're getting longer views per video or long, longer usage per video, longer time that you're building more emotional connection with, with that demographic compared to Instagram. Yeah. And I feel it's like- It's a long-term relationship. Yeah. And I call it the Jordan Peterson effect. Mm. People, before they go to one of his events, probably absorb, I don't know, maybe five hours of his content yep. before you buy a ticket to his event. Now, five hours for him on his lectures, you acquire that very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you were to watch shorts, that could take years. Mm. So then also like, I feel like we're, we're seeing this big divide between long and short mm. now where there are some incredible creators in that shorts world. But I was like, again, when you think about only needing 10 clients to have a profitable PT business, yeah. or when you run a high ticket business, you only need 50 people that love you, mm. right? Why, why are we trying to appease to the masses in a, in a place that, can sometimes feel cheap and better yet, the one biggest thing that's been missing from so much of my content over the years is story. Mm. And now trying to, and to answer your question, if I'd known all this in 2017, I'd probably have been a mental asylum by now. Because it, <laughs> it is, yeah. when you become someone that cares this much about content, like you, you hold so much of your happiness against your creativity. 
Mm. So when you're stuck in a rut of not being creative, I take that very personally. I'm yep. not a very fun person to be around. Like if I, if I'm not being, if I'm not able to squeeze the creative juices, like I become like sad because I'm like, yeah. I haven't had any good ideas, but then when I have a good idea mm. and it performs and I get the one out of 10, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Mm. So there is a double-edged sword to it, but so much of uh, education is actually in stories. So mm. every movie is a story with an educational purpose to it. And mm -hmm. uh, every educational video is a story, but every story is also an educational video. And I never saw that until this year. Okay. So for instance, um, I did a video on YouTube where I burn 5,000 calories, then I eat 5,000 calories. Now that's the story, but intertwined in the story was explaining to people uh, total daily energy expenditure, need, yeah. BMR, everything else. So actually I had to create a story to put an educational piece mm. in. Then I did a video the other day about how one of the biggest food competition eaters stays in shape. That's the story, but really it's about uh, managing calories across the week. So now trying to attract people in with some form of story to then educate them. Mm. That's how you retain people and get people interested in something. Like uh, I want to do one with Ned Brockman soon where okay. I want to run a half marathon in Crocs without training. That's my title. <laughs> I run a half marathon in Crocs without training. But before I do it, I'm going to spend a day with Ned asking him, how do I run long distance? Mm. So then people come to watch me suffer, but then they leave knowing four things about long distance running they yeah. didn't know. And now to me, like if you can captivate people in that way, I think that could be such an integral part of getting people on side. Well, human beings love storytelling, right? So if you can kind of wrap up the information in something that is engaging and they buy into it, like, you know, you're going to deliver your message across, right? And it's also like, it's a bit sneaky. They're like, oh, yeah. fucking hell. They're like, I didn't expect that. In one of my videos, I got a bit carried away teaching people how to skateboard. And everyone was like, why did you put fitness content in a skateboarding video? Yeah. So like, there's so much fun that can be, can be made with it. And I just feel like, one one area, if any coaches are listening to this, well, I fucking hope a lot of them. Yeah. There's one thing that I can notice more than ever is that people notice effort. Mm. We Human beings are so good. Even the biggest idiots amongst us are so good at spotting effort. So mm. let's say someone makes a video and they do some B-roll, they set up a camera in the hallway, they film a close shot of them locking the door, just on a reel about them mm. going to the gym. People don't even realize they're appreciating it, but they're appreciating it. I feel like we could be moving away from this world of low effort content. So like for right now, you've I got, yeah. got $15,000 worth of camera equipment, not to mention some of the lenses. You've got Shure SM7B microphones. These are like <laughs> fucking $400 a pop, nearly a thousand bucks for the Rodecaster 2. You know, like- Is that what it all costs? <laughs> we say that <laughs> close? It's, it's, it's close to like 30 or 40, I'm not a lot. 30, $40,000. Oh, well, okay for a fucking conversation, right? <laughs> in New South Wales, most expensive hotel, right? Yeah. So like, and- Gosh, the, yeah, yeah, far out when you put it in that context. Yeah, so the, yeah. these so are the great levels- great tax deduction. Yeah, these are yeah. the levels that, you know, we're, people are gonna have to get to, but mm. even if you don't have the most fancy equipment, mm. the effort has to be there. And mm. like, for me, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of sensing that. I kind of sense that this, this high effort realm is where we're going, you know, I'm starting to- I think you're spot on. You, you're right. Like it's, I'm seeing it more and more too. It's that the game is, is uh, lifting. 2022, mm. it was great to react to bad TikToks, mm. but people hate that now. Mm. People are oh, fucking, I, I hate it. The negativity, mm. you know, reacting or watching your phone for the first five seconds. Mm. You know, like there are these waves and peaks and troughs and the audience like evolving on this ever like growing kind of spectrum and like, the, I feel so strongly about this where now, even in my head, I'm like, I think I need to spend more time making less videos. I feel like everything mm. has to be- Less volume, more quality. We even saw a realm mm. of these like low quality adverts that were integrated mm. into TikTok to make it feel like it wasn't an advert. Mm. But um, yeah, like I tell you what was interesting for me, this is where my mind's been. I was watching Peaky Blinders a few months ago. Yep. And there's one scene where they just walk across the street and there's some pyro and some fireworks. And I stopped and I said to my missus, you got actors, you got extras, you got uh, costumes, health and safety, we've got pyro, we've got this massive film set. I'm like, there are tens of thousands of dollars for three seconds of footage. Yeah, That probably took half a day. We're mm. sat there and we just take it for granted. 
Mm. I was like, I, we don't ever need to produce content at that level. Mm. But when someone doesn't move something out the fucking background or make their bed for a video, yeah. I'm like, come on, bro. Like, yeah, yeah. When people shoot Oppenheimer and all of these scenes and mm. all of this stuff, like, there is so much that goes on behind the scenes to make things look good. So, in the world of content creation, like, coaches need to start to learn these things, like, um, the law of thirds, which I never appreciate. This will ruin your life, right? <laughs> any photo of anything. Yeah. You know, the grid that you get on your camera yeah. sometimes, right? Yeah. The way they position things into the grid mm. corners or like, if you had a landscape with a tree in it, the tree would be perfectly off to one side at a third. Mm. It would never be in the middle. Mm. So now, even if I see a thumbnail and someone's not used the law of thirds, I'm like, you sloppy bastard. Yeah. But yeah. like, um, yeah, these are- these So are, you feel like social in general is kind of going there, heading into 2024. It's like the year of leveling up. Yeah. Like you mm. want to talk about fat loss, no, nah, do fucking seven day water fast, prove it to me. You know? Yeah. You wanna you wanna talk about the impacts of ketosis, do it for 30 days. Mm. You know, you wanna talk about fat gain, gain the fat. Mm. Like talking about it is not becoming enough because so many people now are cluing on to the fact that talking to a camera can change your life. Now the industry is becoming so much more competitive. Like people are now gonna have to take it upon themselves. It's the, it's the variable, the effort variable. That's you made it. a good point. Like when, when you started out, you were doing all these videos every day at whatever time, everyone was laughing at you. You were collecting emails. No one was fucking collecting emails back in 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, but it was effort, you know? And I think um, that, that, you know, from everything you're saying, I kind of take that as a way is like effort is the variable. And like for your clean health event, mm. we should definitely talk about a collab between like IFS, clean health yep. next year, somewhere cool in Australia. Like, I love um, that. But yeah. then you go to the effort of like lanyards, wristbands, uh, lighting, stage, like all of this stuff. Like people don't realize that LED screen costs fucking $17,000 to hire. You know, like all of these things, but it, it's yep. the effort bit because if there isn't that high resolution LED screen behind the speaker, it changes yep. everything. Yep. So like how, and again, this doesn't apply to everything, but how you do something is how you should do everything. Yep. So if you put that much content into your video and your content, it's going to reflect into your training program. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a sloppy PDF or mm -hmm. whatever it is. So like, yeah, it's, it's an interesting world we're in. It probably freaking a lot of people out. Like, oh, I don't know how much that camera. You just need to start the journey. I think you just need to start, but also like, you know, I, I want to come back to something with you and you've said a few things. I mean, you know, back in the day you were collecting emails, like what, what kind of triggered that for you to kind of start thinking like long-term of owning your own kind of database, owning your own brand? Because I think that's something even just that in itself that a lot of kind of entrepreneurs and trainers don't look at. They just look at social as like potentially the only way to kind of grab a database or grab eyeballs. I'll, I'll reveal one of my first slides at Clean Health. So uh, getting laid and getting sales are very similar. So if you wanted to get a lot of sex, and I will speak, uh, in a slightly misogynistic term, but this is for education. So ladies, yeah. if you're listening, you're welcome. <laughs> so <laughs> if I if I go to the dance floor and I have, I'm in a very happy relationship, so let's say James of 28, yep. he's heading into Surrey Hills tonight to get, to get laid and he goes to the Beresford. Mm. I need to get into the Beresford because that is where prospects are going to be for me. I need to put mm. myself in a place where loads of hot young women. Mm. If I don't put myself in the Beresford, I'm fucked. If yep. I put myself in the you know, some random bowling alley in Taraji. I'm not going to yeah. fucking find anyone. So I've got to put myself in the right place. Mm. And my next tactic is to talk to people. Mm. But what I can't do is get excited and just go around asking girls to sleep with me. It's just not going to happen. Mm. Instead, what I need to do is have an approach, have some kind of um, pitch to them. Then also appreciate that the people in the Beresford aren't looking for dick. They're looking to have a good time with their friends. Yeah. So I need to respect that and say, hey, look, really like you, like what you're about give me the opportunity to have your contact details so that we can c continue to communicate mm. away from the Beresford. Because I want to respect that you're here with your friends doing something. Yeah. One in a hundred might say yes when you say, do you want to come home with me? That's yeah. the problem. So then some people think, okay, I just need to go to the Beresford, talk to 100 girls, go with the first one that goes home. But really you spending time there and chatting to 20 women and getting 10 numbers means mm. that come Monday morning, you can message those 10 women to arrange dates. Now out of the 10 that go on dates, you'll probably sit down with six of them and out mm. of six of them, two will be mental and you end up walking away with four of them, whatever. It's a then better conversion rate than one. So exactly. Mm. So like, and you can't get, you know, disheartened at any part of the stage. 
instead of thinking about dates, like, whoa, don't fucking think about dates, mate. You haven't gone to the Beresford yet. Mm. Go to the Beresford. How many numbers did you get? Oh, I got four. Well, fucking get five next week, right, mate? Mm. Then uh, every time you start talking to people, your chat will get better. Every time you start arranging dates, your WhatsApp skills will get better. Every time you go on dates, your ability to close and convert will become better. Then every time you convert, you'll become more experienced at mm. managing clients. Then, you know, should that person enjoy their experience, they'll become a returning client. Then it's renewals. And you know, like so many of these processes, you can uh, relate to dating. So it becomes actually a lot less scary for coaches when you say face-to-face, -face, right, you're gonna walk the floor, you're mm. gonna talk to a certain amount of people so that you can get a certain amount of consults, up a certain amount of consults you get. And once you get them to the consult, your success rate is kind astronomically yeah. bigger. So really the majority of the hard part is the top part of the funnel, talking yeah. and booking. But when it comes to online, you know, I just did, I pissed myself off the other day. I did a video about a Black Friday offer and I told them to click the link in my bio to buy it. And I went against everything that I said, hey, go from social media to, to closing a sale. And what I did was, is I went to the dance floor and asked people to fuck. Yeah. And our sales were terrible because of it. Mm. I tried to bypass the funnel. Instead, should have run pre-sales, should have got email addresses, should have made it exclusive yep. to that sales funnel to say, hey, we're running a Black Friday offer. I'm not telling yep. you what the fuck it is. Join the email list, it won't cost you anything. I'll let you know about it in 12 hours. Yep. Then I should have sent an email marketing email to them. Mm. Probably done actually its own list where um, you give them the option to unsubscribe. They're either interested or they're not. Mm. Boom. And that that isn't too abrasive. It's not too harsh. I've got something of value. I think you have a problem. If this doesn't work out, it's one email, 14 seconds of reading and click and unsubscribe. I feel like considering that I've spent the last seven years building this business, yeah. we have a good exchange here. And if you still think that's an unfair deal, then join someone else's program. Mm. So like there has to be that, that, that kind of way that you look at that sales process. But even sometimes I fuck up on it. But yeah. the, the email effect, I call it is, People respect emails, right? Mm. If I go for a piss in this podcast, you might check your, you know, Insta DMs, but you're not checking your emails. Yep. The emails, you're going to get your laptop out. When Which if you need off. to, by all means. Oh, There's so a nice bathroom here. I'll check it out. In a <laughs> so like, uh, but the people respect their email time. Yeah. And when they do their emails, they're paying their electricity. They're paying their, uh, you know, council rates. They're yep. doing this, doing that. Amazon reminds you of the thing you left in the basket. Yeah. So then when an offer for personal training or for coaching or whatever comes in, when we spoke before about the behavior of that person and the mindset they're in, mm. they're actually in a very serious mindset to buy. Mm. So that's why, and I kind of appreciated that earlier. I went, when I, when I actually sit down to do my emails, I put my wallet next to the laptop, mm. phone, wallet. It's there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get my credit card out, type it in if it need anything. Mm -hmm. So like people do a disservice just trying to sell straight to the person without doing that. Mm. Uh, it's a good way to look at it. I mean, the, the, it's the nurturing. It's the nurturing effect. I think, you know, too many trainers or people online, they just go straight for the kill. It's like, hey, nice to meet you. Let's fuck. You know, rather than... Fancy a shag. <laughs> you know, rather than, hey, nice to meet you. What's your number? You know, and I think um, you've done that really well. But one thing I want to touch base on is this. Right? New tonic. New tonic. And so I think um, one of the, the things that I took away recently from your launch on that, that you and Chris Williams have done, it's obviously the first like online or first product that you put to market after, you know, like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years building your brand. Why now? So, cause like, you know, just to, to quickly jump in, the whole concept of delayed gratification, you could have done this five years ago, but you chose to just continue to build and build and build. What, what, what led to doing it now? I think uh, several things. So first of all, uh, I would say, I'm very, I was very hesitant to ever branch out into products. And mm. for a fitness person, everyone thinks supplements. And I've never yep. really, I've never really loved supplements. I take mm. creatine, like I have to force it down, whatever. A lot of the time when I take like Lion's Mane or any of these things or Tonga Ali or whatever, I end up doing the pills for like four or five days then I should never do it. But then- yes, That's at least like one out of every three people that do supplements. If you come to my mm. house, you walk in and there's a crit like, a year ago, there's a crate of monster on the side because every day before training, I'll crack a can of monster and go to training yep. or ghost or whatever it is. Or when I lived near an easy mart, I would go get a big bottle of water and an energy drink and go to train. Mm. And I didn't even realize that I became in love with like energy drinks and the idea of priming myself for something. Mm. Or when I sat in a cafe, I would have coffee and coffee and coffee and caffeine the fuck out of myself to get yep. work done. So then 
uh, when nootropics came about, I was always interested in them, but the idea of selling pills is like, man, I don't even fucking like pills. And yeah. this is another thing, right? I feel it's quite fraudulent in some sense because I have a coaching business, but uh, at the moment I'm being coached by a strength coach in America. I'm not even using my own business. Okay. Um, that's not any disservice to my business. It's just that because it's mine, I almost feel like I think I can get away with not doing the sessions or, oh, it's mm. okay because it's mine. So I got this strength coach in America who fucking, like he does a lot of MMA grappling athletes. Okay. Sent me the hardest sessions, but it's kind of uh, excellent. And then my book. So like so many of the things I sell, I don't, I wouldn't go to war with myself because it's mine, right? Mm. But when it comes to this drink, which is part of mine, part of the people, mm. I could sit here and debate you about why these are great for ages. Whereas mm. like, I look back and I'm like, wow, this is something that actually just isn't important to me on like a, uh, you know, a seasonal basis or this or that. I'm like, everywhere I go, I, I want these. Today we had a podcast, I bring a cool box. You know, um, before I go to training, I take some before I record content. I get back home and I'm doing an edit, I have one. Mm. So much of my day is about priming myself for productivity and like, you do it whether you had a social account or not. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that a lot of other people do this as well. So mm. tapping into those is uh, going to be a very exciting prospect because like we don't realize how much we, we are priming ourselves for different activities, whether it's a pre-workout for the gym or mm. whether it's, you know, taking magnesium, putting an eye mask on for bed or whatever yep. it is. We actually go through the day priming each other for it. So when uh, I was proposed by a company in the UK that, they actually came to me almost every single year. I want to do creatine. I was like, nah. Want to do weight protein? Genflow. Yeah, Genflow. I was like, yeah. nah. And then they were like, oh, can you come meet us? And they were like, productivity. What are this space? And mm. they said something. They go, we feel like productivity could be the next fitness. And when they said that, I went, I've never related to something more in my life because hundred percent. If yeah. I'm five kg heavier or five kg lighter, fitter or lighter. I actually don't care that much as long as I feel good. But mm. the one thing that will really fuck with my head is if I've not been productive, yep. which is one of the reasons I barely drink anymore. So mm. I was like, wow, I was like, fuck, productivity is actually one of the pillars of whether or not I'm happy or not. Mm. So then I was like, okay, we need nootropics. Spoke to their little scientist geeks. And then Chris Williamson uh, said to me and Luke, he was like, I want to bring out something in nootropics. And we were like, well, we're in the infancy of something. So we all yeah, come together. Okay. But credit to Chris, right? Chris sometimes can be so intelligent mm. that it's like working with a robot. <laughs> and like, I'm like, well, I'm like, mate, that's not how you interact with another yeah, human, all right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He'll be like, we need some more. He'll say what he's thinking and realize yeah. he hasn't constructed it in a yeah. sentence properly. Yeah. So then uh, they send the flavors over and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a bit of a basic bitch with flavors, right? Oh, Jesse, you got to grab one of the new flavors for us. Oh yeah, the, the yeah. tropical, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could pick the shorter white can, if possible. Yeah, please. That yeah, one there. go on, you have to try this one. Okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, look, fuck, if you know, so this one you ever need out, someone to market it in Australia? I think, I think this one go, I'm your guy. <laughs> I think this one goes out next week. Yeah. So have a taste, what do you think? Oh, wow. I think this is actually my new favorite. Yeah, so. Yeah, we, yeah, so this, I mean, for me, one, two and then three in terms of flat, like that's my palette my wife she's probably more i'd say this would be her number three and she'd go that and orange and then um i think it was gavin gavin one of our, our head of education and product he likes the orange one i think so orange i go through phases i drink a lot of them but this one i want to call it the white monster killer mm. so we sat down and we were like what Actually, the second one was nicer what second flavor is, what flavor is white monster we thought and mm. i was like do you know what i never even thought what flavor is that yeah but then when we got the flavors through, we tried the different variants. And I was like, oh yeah, it's quite nice, quite nice. And Chris was like, this is fucking disgusting. And I was like, Whoa. I was like, I was like, mate, are you all right? And he, yeah. even in the video, he's like, we cannot go to market with this yeah. one. And I'm sitting there going, I'll sign that one off. Yeah. You know, I was like, V5, I, I thought yeah. it was quite good. Yeah. So then Chris was like, fuck this, I'm flying to the UK. Luke was like, I need you back to the UK. So I was like, okay. And we yeah. went to Liverpool, we get in the same room together. And they literally had the scientists in the next room Mm. And they just keep bringing us shots. But having Chris next to me, he was like, actually being able to have the, the, the conversation between us. I was like, okay, mm. that's too full. This is this. We have maybe 65 cans of the competitors in front of us. Then having ours, a sip of theirs, a bit of this. Finally, like we were in there for like seven and a half hours doing these fucking tasting, whatever. Mm. And we signed off three flavors. Then 
it would be weird if we did a citrus, an orange, and then, or like if we, if we did the tropical any earlier, it would have felt weird bringing orange out after. Yeah. So tropical is probably most people's favorites, mm. but it's very interesting. So you found that just with uh, sampling behind the scenes? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And then we've got one more flavor we've signed off in the future. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, help yourself. Help yourself, do you want one? Do you want one? Yeah, yeah help yourself. <laughs> um, so then we have all of these tied up in stock, but one of the interesting things is, right, I. The day we launched it, I was very excited and a few people were dickheads in the comments. And- I, I, I saw that, yeah. But the thing is, right, so far, every can that I've drunk has cost me about $2,000. Mm. So I'm, this isn't a product that was created that I just endorse. I've had to put my own money into it. Yeah. So I'm nearly a, a half million dollar investment for this. I'll mm. tell you about this in the podcast. Mm. So then when we bring something out and people are like, oh, you fucking sell out. I'm like, I spent more on two cans than you earn in a month. Like, don't fucking, yeah, and it really annoyed me. And I had to sit there and be like, mm. relax, relax, relax. But it's also strange in the fact that we do our first one, we were profitable, but then to scale at the scale we want and Rodeola Rosé has to be farmed and it's like going extinct. It's, yeah. We had to put in this massive order. Mm. So they were like, okay, we're gonna need to put this order in now before we've sold Tropical. So then my net position went even lower, but we're all at this risk. And then I sat there going, if this business continues to expand, I could be years away from turning a profit. People don't realize in some, we have a, a, a TGA based like pharmaceutical supplement company as well. I was mentioning this to Luke actually. And the, um, with some of the ingredients, you can be up for exorbitant amounts of capital just to secure the supply chain demand. Then not only do you have to bring that in, you then need to hold it and hope that it sells. And if it does sell quicker than possible, then you need to recirculate the orders. So it's like people don't realize that to do something like this, and I was like really impressed with the ways that, way that you guys like pre-launch it and launch it. There's so much time and money that goes into it. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden I've sold out, I've made all my money back. It, was, could, it could be a lengthy process. Especially in winter, the time difference was so yeah. fucked. I'd be there at 5 a.m. going through fonts, can designs, colors, yeah. like all of this shit. And like, it got to the point where I was almost dreading having to fucking launch the thing. But then when mm. I, when I had the first can a few months ago, I was like, oh fuck, this is like, this mm. is really nice. And I love the idea of having a product. But yeah, if for instance, I've just made this online coaching course that goes over some of the concepts we've gone through today. Okay. But that is like three weeks of filming. And then the second it goes live, it will go into profit. Mm. And I'll be earning money from that as a digital asset. Whereas a physical product, although you're, potential for getting into that higher echelon of making incredible sales. Mm. You, like I say, it could take years to become profitable. Like the patience for something like that is, it's great because I love it. And I think that, you know, I'm hopefully going to Dubai in a few days. The US embassy have got my passport. And um, <laughs> okay, yeah, they're not being too responsive either. Oh no. But the fact <laughs> that I can have a can on me all the time and yeah. like, if there's any people on the fringe, I can be like, hey, try this, or it's not mm. even out there yet. It's exciting. I'm excited to launch in uh, Australia. But then again, even the reason the cans are different heights is in mm. America, you've got to have a different can size. Yeah. You've got to have different print. You've got yeah. to have different things on the back. For us to bring it to Australia, we have to have that little 10 cent icon on the can. You've got to get yeah. the recycling stuff. Then we've got the legality of the new tropics and all these yeah. formulas, the caffeine content and you've got of the, the can. TGA. So like <laughs> people are like, oh, yeah. why aren't you got it here? I'm like, oh, pulling my, what's left of my hair out. I'm like, yeah. but um, no, it's, it's an exciting project. I, I really like it. And like, even the fact today to come along and nick my uh, missus's dad's call bag, just to like bring some drinks to whatever I'm doing. Like, because if not, if we'd never done this, I probably would have brought a can of monster. So yeah. like, it was something that I did anyway. What advice would you actually give to like, because I can look back and, and, and kind of see it's like you've, you've built the following, the trust, and it makes sense, especially if it's something that is part of your life that you would do anyway to kind of, as you've done, you know, put your own money and time into doing it. What advice would you give to, whether it's a trainer or entrepreneur that wants to like launch their own product? Like, because it, it is like, to your point, it is very different launching a physical product compared to an online product. You know, my, my core business is all online, so I know that space very well. You're right, once you build it out, it's profit, right? I would say to people kind of counterintuitively, don't be afraid to have partners with equity. Like some people- uh, Actually, yeah, I wanna, yeah. Some people are like so afraid to give up their business. Mm. When I started working with other James at the academy, I didn't make him an offer. I said, how much do you want? 
We, mm. he, was, he was integral to me. He was integral to my business. Mm. My business wouldn't work without him. So then I said to him, how much do you want? And he yep. asked for a percentage and everyone said, that's too much. And I yep. said, fuck you. I said, if, if we want to make more money, I don't get 10% more equity. We make more money together. Mm. The same sense with the drink, like, you know, oh, we could have done it without Chris. I'm like, well, actually Chris has turned out to be integral for the taste to be so fucking good. Mm. Also, he's invaluable as far as, you know, just the way he's positioned himself and established himself and all of that. Could we have made more money without him? Maybe, but I would almost rather make less money with more people. Like yeah. they say faster alone, further together. hundred percent. So yeah. like that's probably the main bit of advice I'd say. If you don't mind me asking, like across your different businesses, how many partners do you have? Three now. So yeah. Luke and I, uh, all my events are Luke and I. Mm -hmm. uh, publishing is Luke and I. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke's the silent six foot five partner that yeah. stays off the camera. <laughs> um, James Smith Media, so any of our income that comes from like YouTube or any of that, Luke and I. Yep. James Smith Academy, James and I. Okay. And then Newtonic, Luke, myself, Jan, Flo and Chris. And what do you look for? Because I mean, you seem like you've become very self-aware over the years of where your strengths lie and where your weaknesses are, and obviously have outsourced those weaknesses to people that you trust. What do you look for in a relationship when it comes to someone as a business partner? So- and like uh, what advice could you give to someone that might have an opportunity like that in the future too? I think it's important to not go into business the people that are the same as you. Mm. So my business partner, James Shaw, uh, he's the complete opposite of me. Okay. He does payroll accounting. Yep works on people's KPIs. He does a lot of what I would consider the dry stuff, but then he doesn't want to ever talk on camera. Mm. So even when we met, uh, we sat with PwC when we put the company together yep. and the guys are like, you guys are great because you're polar opposites. I'm like, mm. we should we should buy that. And he's like, no, he, I want to spend money. He wants to save it, yep. you know? So um, that for sure. And then uh, also if you go into business with someone who's further ahead than you, like Luke, for instance, he's, he feels more like an older brother. Mm. So. This is crazy, right? People probably won't believe this when I say it. So I looked at our bank account once when we formed the business in maybe 2018. I haven't accessed our bank account since. So although I'm the majority shareholder of the business, mm. I just trust Luke with everything. So mm. he could be skimming money from me. He could be. Mm. It'd be an expensive mistake if he is. <laughs> but I can't express the amount of trust that I have in a guy that I only met a few years ago yeah. to the point that even say I want to buy something, I go, can I afford this? And he's there and he gives me advice, gives me life advice. Mm. Um, and even just little things like, he has a guy that works for him who's a bit of an idiot. And I go, why do you have this guy working for you? He goes, he's an idiot, but if I need to hide a body at three in the morning, he'll help me. And yeah. I went, do you know what? I like that. So yeah, yeah. Um, I have partners that I can lean on, but I also have partners that I learn from. Mm. And uh, that's really important because People can all too easily look at your team and see you as talent. Yeah. But even in my pools of partners, I would even say I'm one of the least competent. Mm. I'm just the front man to the people that are more competent. Yeah. So it's like a funnel, cold, warm, hot, front, medium, you know, back end. I mean, I, I look at it, we've got with one of our products, uh, the Physique Coaching Academy with Lane, it's Lane, myself and Professor Bill Campbell. You know, we all bring different elements to the, to the business where alike in terms of our ethics, morals, and values, and how we see the world, you know, very much so. But in terms of our skill set in the business side of things, we complement each other extremely well. And that's, that's mm. like such an important lesson. Like you're better off having less pie, but more people exactly. that can to yep. lean in. I'll tell you a funny one. Probably shouldn't be saying this. I might have signed a contract, but fuck it. Um, <laughs> I got legal action from an Australian. Uh, I've had a few of those over the years. They're fun. She waited for me to get back into Australia before pressing me for it. So yep. um, she'd said something non-factual online. I'd called her out. She ended mm. up losing her job and deleting her social media, which I didn't intend, but she was mm. being a bit of an idiot. Anyway, she wanted a public apology. So I go to Luke, I go, what do we do here? He goes, absolutely not. So uh, we're in Sydney, we're doing an event and uh, he messages the lawyer and goes, can you serve James on stage? Cause we think it'd be quite good for the event. <laughs> And the lawyer goes, absolutely not. So he goes, oh, he goes, all right, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you come to the event? Uh, we'll be there from about 5 PM mm. and we'll do this. Then the guy goes, okay, Friday night. It's like 11 PM. And I look at Luke and I go, did you meet the lawyer? And he goes, of course I didn't fucking meet the lawyer. Mm. And I go, where is he? He goes, he's probably still outside. Mm. And he, I said, why? And he goes, well, this is going to be billed to the person that's suing you. And I thought, 
fucking hell, never in a million years would I have thought of something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, because when something impacts you, it can seem like the worst thing in the world, but to mm. have someone around you that understands how the game works and everything like that, yeah. like it's invaluable. Like when something goes good, they can be like, calm down, this is usual for the first week. When something goes bad, they go, mm. oh, you know, like I couldn't imagine anything worse than experience success on my own. Yeah. Because it, 100%. it just seems like such a, a, a weird- Well, a lonely journey. Yeah. Too, you know, like who, who are you sharing your wins with? Who, who are you sharing your losses with? Yeah. Even even now, like I'll be honest with you, the academy this year, mm. even though we are at the lower end, well, the thing is we wanted an affordable business. We went the opposite of high ticket. Mm. And we've now got a demographic of the most affected people from the current economy. Mm. So it's made business a little bit tougher. But mm. when we talk about it, we almost laugh and cherish it. We're like, oh, well, if we got a business, we came this far, mm. which is not going to happen. But actually the struggles are keeping us in check. Like things becoming harder for us as a business, we're actually thriving in it. Mm. I kind of am quite happy in some respects that none of our businesses did too well too early on. Mm. Because if I had made millions in my first couple of years, I probably would have become very complacent. So even like the graph, the struggle, the, mm. you know, getting off the ground, it, I know it sounds cliche, but it's such an integral part of the kind of journey, you know? 100%. Like, Look, that part there, I mean, I, I, my first few years, I did go like that. And then I guess a sense of invincibility <laughs> came, you know, fucking Superman. And then all of a sudden the universe goes like this, whoosh, and then you're millions of dollars in debt, you know, liquidating a business, trying to, you know, pull yourself back out of the fucking, the swamp. So it, it does, like, I agree with you, like going through a, you know, step-by-step -step journey does actually make you appreciate it more too. Yeah, a hundred percent. And yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, that, that I'm always kind of, kind of grateful for it keeps everyone kind of grounded as well yeah because some people uh they do get a bit carried away i agree and i think some people you can tell some people get into this kind of business for the wrong reason you find out i agree kind of soon and uh but now i think it's uh it's important to have yeah the right people around you it's just difficult to find them definitely and definitely. i'm i'm very lucky so now one of my main business partners that like, how'd you meet i'm like oh you just emailed me yeah and like uh even then yeah and then, oh, so what happened then? I was like, I just, just agreed. Mm. Just wasn't too bothered. So I want to finish on two questions, all right? First question, shameless self-plug for Clean Health Live. Obviously, you're up there with Lane, with uh, Sebastian Roy, with Hattie, Mark Carroll, Lauren Simpson. Who else we got? Jackson Pios. I'm doing some stuff there. Talk to us, like, you know, obviously, you know, you know a lot of these guys over the years. I know when, when we first connected about it, I mean, I could kind of sense the excitement of being able to actually be up on stage with these guys and doing this type of thing. Like, what do you want to bring? If someone is listening right now, like, what are they going to learn coming and listening to you at Clean Health Live? So, like, even if I haven't been probably one of the best coaches or whatever, like, sales and marketing is, like, mm. my, my favorite thing. It's mm. the thing that I'm most passionate about. And I like to say that, I have a delivery method to really get people to understand things. Mm. Like even, even if you were to look at my fitness content, there must have been a point for some people where they go, oh, I never thought of it like that. Mm. And that's the way I want to approach the real fundamentals of sales and marketing. Like even mm. similar to that kind of sex analogy, it would be like in two days of not just an hour and a half of that, but then I want to give up my time to anyone over the weekend for ask me questions, challenge me, mm. you know, uh, interactive Q and A's, even at mm. the bar, whatever it is like, yep. But not only that, but the other people that are speaking there are people that I not only learn from, like, for instance, anything that's kind of on the edge, I go to Lane for all the time. Yeah. Not only that, I rip off his content, but I still quote him in it. You know, <laughs> half my YouTube videos have yeah, got quotes yeah. to studies yeah. that Lane put on his. Yeah. Um, no, Hattie, Lauren, Mark Carroll has done exceptionally well. He has. Like, I, I look at Mark and go, that guy is a better coach than me. Mm. And I, I, I like being able to go that. Same with Sebastian Orip, like mm. uh, Baz as well. I trained with him even just a couple months ago and he helps me so much. But the beautiful thing about this is like, you've, you've created a lineup of people that aren't just there for that time in the limelight on the stage. They're people that if someone goes, excuse me, Lane, can I just ask you about this? They're onto it. Oh, they're here to serve. You yeah. Know, all of them are here to serve. I think, um, you know, this year's event, everyone was there and it's like for the students that were there, it wasn't just the time on stage. Like they were sitting in the crowd. They were sitting there on the lunch tables. They were engaging and, and, you know, asking questions and being interactive with the students. I'll put this route. one down the lens as well, right? Yeah. Your most expensive ticket, was it 1,000, 2,000? 2,000. 2,000. Yeah. Thir there'll be uh, 50 of those, that's it. So the average person would only need to acquire two clients to pay for that within a year. 
mm. which is a business deductible cost. Yep. So you're, if, if you only came into my talk and not anyone else's, and you were only able to acquire two new clients, you would see a return on investment within a year. Mm. That is worst case scenario yep. that it won't cost you anything. Mm. Best case scenario is, you know, I've had a million dollar idea from a seven pound book. Like mm. you can't stress the importance. There might be that one thing at that event that just sets a light your business. And like, it's just getting in the room. How many yeah. people, right? If you're watching this on YouTube or on Instagram or whatever, you would never leave the country without creatine because you know it gives you 10% gains. Yeah. Why would you not go to a course that could give you way more than 10% gains to your business? You know what I mean? Don't leave your creatine at home, but you know, oh, I might not go, whatever. And if you're coming on your own and you're scared, so is everyone. Get I think that's what it. people forget. Like even like all of the people that we've got presenting, like Lane, every single one of them, and I didn't even realize until we spoke today, just the amount of stuff that you've done over the years too, which it, it's no surprise because if I look at anyone that has built up a brand and built up a level of success, not just in fitness, but in any industry, they're always reinvesting into the most important asset, which is themselves, right? But all of these guys, it's funny, like Jackson Pios, right? He's, he's built up this, he's a PhD in sports nutrition. He's built up this uh, amazing business in Empire of in Bali. He actually used to attend Sebastian's workshops eight years ago as a student. And then eight years later, he's on stage. Uh, Mark Carroll, he was our head coach at our clean health gym. Right. I remember. He was our head coach at our clean health gym doing 50, 60 sessions a week six years ago. Right. Um, you know, Lauren Simpson was in corporate six, six years ago and stuff like that. So I think it's all of those people in the room have actually, they've practiced what they've preached in terms of their mindset towards leveling up and serving their clients. And it's very easy for us to paint the picture that mm. people got lucky. Well, no. I try and do sometimes, I look at Lane's old videos. 10 years ago, he was doing this, still in front of a camera. Yeah. He had medals in the background. Not too sure about that. Yeah. You know, like, either these people on the lineup yeah. are incredibly lucky or they have a system for success that mm. they've utilized themselves that they'll be happy to share on the weekend. Agreed. So it'd be the biggest disservice to your business if you don't attend. I'm excited, man. And we're very grateful to have you obviously coming out, man. I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited to listen to you more there, especially on day three when we've got the intimate group and like can kind of really get into things. I think it's going to be awesome. It's good. I've made my life very boring but happy where I live and then coming out of it for a weekend of carnage I love it yep. and then by the time the weekend's over I'm ready to be an introvert for another two months yep I hear that so talk to me heading into 2024 what's new for you I know that you, you're off to Dubai in a few days mm. I, I, I see that you've got this tour in the States and Canada yep too although they got your passport so yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so got that then go home see my family for a bit yeah then when I come back in January I'm just gonna hunker down start mm -hmm. writing again start producing more content. Okay. Uh, I want to get to a million subs on YouTube next year. Where are you at now? Uh, 3.15. Okay. So, but nearly doing, like when I'm, when I'm actually at home, I'm doing about a thousand subs a day, which is still fucking okay. insane. And like, yep. even though there were some shitty comments on the launch there, it's credit, it's mad. After the launch video went out, which I didn't really like, I went live and every day there's comments going, I just bought a case, just bought a case, just bought a case, just bought a case. Like, so, yeah, I want to get to a million subs purely uh, just to flex. I'll get the gold play button. And then every- every will be in the background videos. <laughs> every big thing that I've wanted, yeah. I've got it and felt incredibly numb. When I got to a million followers, I was like, oh, is mm. this it? Then I did it on TikTok. Oh, is this it? I, mm. I came back from training. I'd say to my housemates when I lived with them, I just got a million. They're like, we don't care. I was like, oh. Then yeah. I got my silver play button. And I was like, oh, oh, don't care. Yeah. So I can't wait to get the gold one, go home, put it on the shelf, not care about it. Yeah. And then set the next site as 10 million and, you know, be disheartened for the next five years trying to get there. But yeah, yeah like um, it, I'm, I'm just excited for next year to just get in a routine of putting out good content, coming to clean health. Uh, I really love the business side of things. Like mm. I love helping people with a back squat and RDL and a hip hinge. Yeah. But there's nothing better than seeing... So I used to be a burnt out, underpaid, overworked coach, mm. and now I'm not. And mm. there's nothing more exciting to me than being in a room with underpaid, overworked, burnt out coaches, seeing them a year later, and them going, fuck it, they look healthier. Well, you know what, I think it comes to that place of like serving the next generation. You know, like I spent the first 10 years of my career being a PT, then I spent the last 10 years being involved in educating PTs. Mm. You know, so, so it's like kind of achieving that level of success yourself, then giving it back. It's actually, you know, people ask me now, like, you still fucking, you know, doing these early starts, late days with these kids. I'm like, it's because I fucking love what I do. Yeah. Like, it's not work. I would do this anyway. I love it. So, yeah, come to Clean Health. You'll love your job more and probably make more money.
and we'll end on that quote, brother. Thank you very much for uh, coming, mate. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs>